Welcome back, everyone. Today we will be reading Chapter 22. Let's get into it. The explosion in the refinery core had exactly the impact Saren was looking for. Panic and chaos descended over the plant. The alarms had sent people fleeing for the exits, frantic to get away from the destruction. But while everyone else was running out, Saren was working his way farther in, moving against the flow of the crowd. Most of the people ignored him, concentrating only on their own desperate flight. He had to act quickly. The detonation he'd set off had only been the first in a chain reaction that would cause the vats of molten ore to overheat. When they erupted, all the machinery in the processing core would ignite in flames. The turbines and generators would overload, triggering a series of explosions that would reduce the entire planet to burning rubble. The, the entire plant to burning rubble. Scanning the crowd, Saren at last saw what he was looking for. A small group of blue sun mercs, heavily armed and moving together as a single unit. Like Saren, they were heading deeper into the plant. All he had to do was follow them. What are we waiting for? Quan screamed, almost hysterical. He held up a small metal case and waved it frantically in Eden's, Eden's face. Inside was a flash drive containing all the data they had gathered on the project. We have everything we need right here. Let's go. Not yet, the Batarian said, trying to remain calm, despite the, the clax, klaxons ringing so loudly he could barely hear himself think. Wait for our escorts to arrive. He knew the explosion in the core was more than just a coincidence, and he wasn't about to go running out into a trap, not without his bodyguards. What about them? Quan uh, shouted, pointing at the two mercs standing nervously just outside the door of the room in which he had been holed up ever since the attack on Sidon. They're not enough, Adon replied. I'm not taking any chances. We wait for the rest of... The words were cut off by the sound of gunfire from the other room, mingling them with the alarms and shouts from, the, from his guards. This was followed by a second of silence, and then an unfamiliar figure appeared at the door. Your escort isn't going to make it, the armored Turian said. Even though he'd never met the man before, Adon instantly recognized him. I know you, he said. The specter, Saren. You did this? Quan screamed, pointing a shaking finger at Saren. This is your fault! Are you going to kill us now? Adon asked, surprisingly. He wasn't, surprisingly, he wasn't afraid. It was as if he'd known this moment was coming all along, and now that his death was upon him, he felt only a strange sense of calm. But the Turian didn't kill, kill them. Instead, he asked a question. What were you working on at Sidon? Nothing, Quan shouted, clutching the metal case to his chest. It's ours! Adon recognized the look in Saren's eye. He'd made his entire fortune off that look. Hunger, desire, the lust to possess. You know, he whispered, realizing the truth, not everything, but just enough so that you want to know more. A faint smile creased his lips. There was a chance he might still get out of this alive. Shut up! Quan screamed at him. He'll take it from us! I don't think so, the Don replied, speaking more to Saren than the raving scientist. We have something he wants. He needs to keep us alive. Not both of you, Saren warned. Something in his tone pierced the veil of Quan's madness. You need me! He insisted in a rare moment of lucidity. You need my research, my expertise. He was speaking quickly, desperate and scared. However, it wasn't clear if he was more frightened of death or of losing out on the chance to continue his obsessive research. Without me, you'll never understand it. Never figure out how to unlock its power. I'm essential to the project. Saren raised his pistol and pointed it straight at the babbling human. Then, he turned his head toward Adon. Is this true? He asked the Batarian. Adon shrugged. We have copies of all his research, and I have my own team studying the artifact. Quan is brilliant, but 
he's become erratic. I think the time has come for him to be replaced. No sooner were the words out of his mouth than Saren fired. Quan went rigid and toppled over backward, a single bullet hole in his head. The metal case fell from his hands and clattered to the floor, the flash drive inside well protected from the impact by the padded interior. And what about you? The specter asked, aiming the pistol at the Batarian. When he'd thought there was no hope of survival, Adon had been calm, resigned to his fate. Now that he saw a chance to escape with his life, the gun pointed in his direction filled him with a cold fear. I know where it is, he said. How will you find it without any... <coughs> Excuse me. Without my help. Saren nodded his head in the direction of the metal case. There's probably something in there that'll tell me. What, tell me what I need to know. Uh, I, 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 I have resources. Adon stammered, scrambling to find another argument capable of staying the executioner's hand. People, power, money. The cost of the project is astronomical. If you kill me, how will you find it? Or how will you fund it? You aren't the only one with wealth and influence, the Turian reminded him. I can find another money man without even leaving the verge. Think of how much time and effort I've put into this, Eden Idan blurted out. Kill me, and you'll have us have to start from scratch. Saren stayed silent, but he did tilt his head slightly to the side, as if considering what the Batarian had said. You have no idea what this thing is capable of, Adon continued, pressing his point. It's like nothing the galaxy has ever seen before. Even with Quan's files, you won't find anybody who can just set up, step up and resume work on the project. I've been involved from the beginning. I have a fundamental understanding of what we're dealing with. Nobody else in the galaxy can offer you that. From the expression on the Turian's face, it was obvious he was buying into Adon's argument. If you kill me, you don't just lose my financial backing, you lose my experience. You might find someone else to fund the project, but that will take time. If you kill me, you'll be starting over from the beginning. You're not going to throw away three years of my groundwork just so you can have the satisfaction of shooting me. I don't mind waiting a few extra years, Saren replied as he squeezed the trigger. I'm a very patient man. Kaylee and Anderson were still inside the main building of the refinery when the second explosion came. The blast originated near the processing core's vats of molten ore. A geyser of fiery liquid erupted from the heart of the facility, shooting up 300 meters into the sky. The glowing pillar mushroomed, spreading out to illuminate the, the night before collapsing to, to rain, red-hot death down over everything within a half-kilometer radius. Keep moving, Anderson shouted, straining to be heard above the shrieking alarms. The plant was already structurally weakened by the first two explosions, and more were sure to follow. We have to get outside before this place caves in on us. He led the way, one hand clutching the assault rifle, the other clenching Kaylee's wrists as he dragged the weakened young woman along with him. They emerged from the plant, racing for the perimeter fence, the lieutenant frantically scanning the area around them for any signs of pursuit. <coughs> My God, Kaylee gasped, pulling up short and forcing Anderson to do the same. He glanced back and saw her staring out into the distance. He turned to follow her gaze, then whispered a small prayer of his own. The entire work camp was ablaze. Shielded by the roof and walls of the refinery, the two humans had been protected from the deluge of molten ore. Those outside the plant, the men, women, and children in the work camps, were not so lucky. Every building seemed to be on fire, a fierce orange wall of flames ringing them in. We'll never get through that, Kaylee moaned, collapsing to the ground, overwhelmed with exhaustion and fatigue. 
Another explosion shook the facility. Glancing back, Anderson saw the plant was on fire now, too. By the light of the flames, he could see dark vapors crawling out from the, from the windows. Toxic chemical clouds released by the destruction. Don't give up, Anderson shouted, grabbing her by the shoulders and hauling her to her feet. We can make it. Kaylee only shook her head. He could see it in, in her eyes. After everything she'd already been through, since the destruction of Sidon, this was finally uh, too much for her. She didn't have anything left. She'd finally given, a, given in to despair. I can't. I'm too tired, she said, slumping back down. Just leave me. He couldn't carry her the rest of the way. They had too far to go. And with her draped over his back, he was afraid he wouldn't be able to move fast enough to get through the flame-engulfed work camp without them both burning to death. Kaylee hadn't enlisted to serve on the battlefront. She was a scientist, a thinker, but all of humanity's soldiers went through the same basic training. Before they became part of the Alliance, they had to endure months of grueling physical ordeals. They were taught to push themselves to their limits and beyond. And when their bodies threatened to simply keel over from fatigue and exhaustion, they had to find a way to keep going. They had to break through the mental barriers holding them back and push further than they ever imagined was possible. It was a rite of passage, a bond shared by every man and woman in the Systems Alliance military. It united them and gave them strength, transformed them into living symbols, flesh and blood manifestations of the indomitable human spirit. Anderson knew he had to tap into that now. Damn it, Saunders, he shouted at her. Don't you dare quit on me now. Your unit is moving out. So get up off your ass and get your feet moving. That's an order. Like a good soldier, Kaylee responded to his commands. Somehow she got back to her feet, still clutching her weapon. She broke into a slow, lumbering run, her will forcing her body to do what her mind told her it couldn't. Anderson watched her for a second to make sure she wouldn't topple over, then fell into step, into step behind her, matching Kaylee's pace as they raced toward the smoke, screams, and flames coming from the buildings in front of them. The work camp had become hell itself. The roaring of the flames rose up from the conflagulation to mingle with shrieks of pain and keening cries of terror and loss. The horrible cacophony was punctured, punctuated by the occasional ear-splitting thunder of another detonation from somewhere inside the plant. Greasy black clouds rolled across the rooftops and down to the ground as the fire leaped from building to building, devouring the entire camp one structure uh, at a time. The heat was like a living thing, clutching and grabbing at their limbs, scraping the uh, searing claws across their skin as they ran past. Acrid smoke stung their eyes and crawled down their lungs, choking them with each breath. The sickly stench of burning flesh was everywhere. Bodies lay strewn about the streets, many of them children. Some were victims of the molten ore that had rained down, charred husks lying in bubbling puddles of their own melted flesh. Others had succumbed to the smoke or flames, their corpses curling up into the fetal position as muscles and sinew shriveled and burned. Still, others had been trampled by the stampede of those trying to escape, their limbs broken and bent at grotesque, unnatural angles. Their faces smashed to a bloody pulp beneath the heedless feet of their, of their neighbors. For all the combat Anderson had endured, for all the battles he'd fought, for all the atrocities of war he'd witnessed firsthand, nothing had prepared the lieutenant for the horrors he saw during the remainder of that, their flight from the refinery. But there was nothing they could do for the victims, no aid they could offer. All they could do was put their heads down, crouch low, and keep running. Kaylee stumbled and fell several times during their desperate flight, only to push valiantly on. Each time, Anderson hauled her back to her feet. 
and by some miracle they made it through hell alive, arriving just in time to see Saren tossing a small metal case into the back of the rover. The Turian looked at them in surprise, and in the glow from the fires of the burning camp behind them, Anderson was convinced he saw the specter scowl. He didn't say anything as he climbed into the vehicle, and for a second, Anderson thought Saren was going to drive away and just leave them there. Get in, the Turian shouted. Maybe it was the sight of the automatic assault rifles they both carried. Maybe he was afraid someone would find out if he abandoned them. Anderson didn't really care. He was just glad the specter waited. He helped Kaylee up into the vehicle, then scrambled in beside her. Where's Adon? He asked as the engines roared to life. Dead. What about Dr. Kwan? Kaylee wanted to know. Him too. Saren slammed the rover into gear, the wheels kicking up small bits of sand and gravel as they took off. Anderson slumped back against his seat. All thoughts of the small metal case slipped from his mind as he surrendered to utter exhaustion. The rover sped away into the night, leaving the grim scene of death and destruction farther and farther behind them. That's it for chapter 22. We'll see you guys next week with the epilogue. Thank you.